Welcome to the Complexity Theory Podcast. My name is Zach McCormick. I am a lawyer, but this is not legal advice. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different and kind of go more topical, have more of a conversation. Uh, my guest today is, again, my brother, Ephraim McCormick, and he's got some interesting new hobbies that he's going to talk to us about, and um, we might cover a few other topics and kind of just see where the conversation takes us. Ephraim, thanks for coming back on. Happy to. Yeah. So I understand that your latest hobby, mm-hmm. passion in the making, <laughs> is some really interesting artwork you've been doing. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. So I uh, kind of went down a rabbit hole, as one does. I recently started to get a little bit more interested in art and sketching and looking at the idea of uh like starting from scratch with the various techniques that you see online, like, you know, draw the circle, draw the, the lines and something like that, and then build up detail, etc. It just was very daunting to me. And it wasn't something that I was, I had the time to, um, to, to take on. And then I started recently getting some targeted advertisements for a device called a camera lucida. So the algorithm got you. The algorithm definitely got me, 100%. And speaking of the algorithm, um, yeah. you've actually posted a lot of this to your Instagram, right? I have, yeah. yeah it's just my Should we pull some of it up? Sure, if you want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah, it's uh, at E.L. McCormick is my thing. Okay. Uh, but anyway, as you're doing that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll continue on. But the, the, so Camera Lucida is a device. It's essentially just a prism. Um, it's a little prism that kind of floats near your eye on a stand. You can take it anywhere. Um, in fact, actually a lot of Renaissance, uh, painters did take it everywhere. Um, and, uh, what it does. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's one of this one that I have in, in the works, but this one is another one. Yeah. That's, that's one of the ones I'm actually most proud of. So, um, so do we have, like, if we scroll through this one, are we going to see the device? Yes. Well, okay. you'll see a little bit of it and you'll see there. So that is actually not a camera lucida. What that is, um, which is kind of spoiling what happened, is uh, there's a, a device called a comparator mirror, which is a mirror that is uh, placed at a 45 degree angle, equidistant to both a reflecting reference material and the bottom. So as you can see in this one, mm-hmm. uh, up top there is the mm-hmm. reference photo. I have the reference photo on the left there just to kind of show you. But the one on the top is what I'm actually trying to sketch. Okay. Um, and since it's mirrored, it mirrors it down right side up. Mm-hmm. And I essentially trace. Mm-hmm. I just kind of move my eye back and forth to like make sure that I know where my lines are going. Um, so it I is can... all freehand, though. It is, yes. But it is a form of tracing like a lot of artists apparently consider it to be cheating um i don't really care because i'm not trying to like rank myself amongst <laughs> yeah. the greats i just want to do this for fun um and i want to see results more quickly than not it's also helping me to uh like yeah as you can see here this is um a place called lake bled in slovenia it's an island it's a church that has mm. an island uh or it's an island has a church on it in the middle of a lake so I know you brought this machine with you, this yeah. device that you built, and uh, would you be willing to share it with us? I would. Thank you for asking. So it's this. Um, and this is based off of plans. I didn't invent this by any means. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty interesting piece of math, um, or geometry, rather, to try and, try and do. So what it essentially is comprised of is, um, yeah, it's comprised of two... Uh, pieces of board. I'll put it into that so you can see. It's comprised of two uh, pieces of board that are secured at uh, an exact right angle. Um, and then this mirror, the stock of which is at a 45 degree angle, and the mirror itself is also at a 45 degree angle that is equidistant from both planes. And the reason it needs to be at equidistant, uh, equidistant lengths and the reason it needs to be at 45 degree angles is because in order to utilize it properly, uh, you need to make sure that the reflection doesn't move. Um, when you're looking into a regular mirror, uh, if you move around, you will notice that like things will shift slightly. With this, um, since it's at an exact 45 degree angle, the cool thing is that the reflection doesn't move at all. It just stays in place, which means that any, uh, any design that I essentially trace from the reflection is not going to be distorted in any way. Um, 
we were just talking or we were you know seeing earlier in some of my work that like you couldn't really tell there but there's others where it's very pronounced where it's slightly distorted my first acrylic painting that i've ever made um was uh of a, a it was this this bust this uh, little black and white um painting of a bust that's in a museum in vienna and i traced those lines perfectly according to this mirror right and i i uh you know traced them around perfectly and then i painted and then it was only when i had finished the painting that i realized that she her face was like mm. kind of scrunched and that was the issue with the mirror moving yes gotcha. um it's kind of like the equivalent of uh if you've ever accidentally gotten a photo stuck in a printer and it like the paper yes. jams so it kind of right? like kinda almost rrr, rrr, rrr. stretches it yeah so it'd be the opposite of that it just kind of scrunches it can you i see you brought some of your your artistry pencils can you maybe give us a tiny demo yeah absolutely the trick here is to line up the image that you're trying to paint the reference image uh with your bottom perfectly and then you're going to be looking down at the mirror to try and make sure that all of your shadows and everything are, in fact, correctly placed. So what you're essentially doing is you are tracing. This is a form of tracing. As you can see, as I'm going, I'm just making these small, minute markings that will line up perfectly with the reflection. Just from watching you, it's interesting because there isn't any functional difference between looking up at your subject mm -hmm. and drawing accordingly and what you're doing here. It seems like it's just a question of reducing the amount of distance that your eye has to travel to look at the subject. Yes. Oh, absolutely. So it's not... It's not tracing in the strictest sense. Tracing would be something where you take the line that's already created mm -hmm. and then essentially copy, you know, follow the line on a page. This is actually just allowing you to see a little better. Yeah. By reducing the amount of movement your eye has to, to make. You don't have to look up, you know, 40 degrees or whatever. You, you're looking one degree. Up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's like when I first started out, one of the things that I was thinking is, okay, this is going to be because I am tracing, mm -hmm. right? That's what I was thinking. Like, because I'm tracing, it's going to be very easy. So this is, this is obviously a work in progress for you. It seems like it's very therapeutic too. Oh yeah. Good way to unwind. Oh yeah. No, it's, it's, it's definitely a de-stressor for sure. It's, it's, um, Heather and I have been doing uh, like puzzles, things mm. like that. It's it's very similar in that kind of calm dynamic to doing a puzzle because essentially you're you're creating an image from nothing, and it's very similar to assembling a puzzle. Um, at least that's how I kind of interpret it. Um, but yeah, so there was a there was a a documentary called Tim's Vermeer, which uh, this guy named Tim uh, as a as a friend of uh, the famous magicians. They call me. Tim? Yes. Um, he's a friend of the famous musicians, uh, Penn and Teller. And he just had this idea that Vermeer, the Renaissance painter, um, could have potentially used a device very similar to this. Um, there was a supposition that Vermeer may have used a camera lucida. But what a camera lucida does, um, a camera lucida is a prism that kind of, uh, you put it on a stand and it floats near your eye and you can look through it and it'll, it'll have a translucent element of what you're looking at and on the page beneath you. Right. Is this almost like like a projector? Yes, it's it is actually it is a projector. It uses the same mechanics as one of those projectors, like the the old school projectors, yeah, right? right. Um, except it's the reverse, where you're you're the one who's coming in it. and putting it down over exactly. your medium, your yes. paper, your canvas. Yeah, and a camera lucid is very useful. It's very uh, versatile. You can take it outdoors. You mm -hmm. can any subject that you want. You can sketch with a camera lucida it is it is a very it, it is closer to tracing than this is and so that would um, almost be the earliest form not of a camera in the traditional sense mm -hmm. but the idea would be to replicate an image as it appears as precisely as it appears to the human eye yes this would have been the closest thing to it and then it just yeah. would have required a steady hand and in fact there are some there's a lot of uh, painting scholars i went down a rabbit hole <laughs> there's yeah, a lot of that. painting scholars who um can actually spot 
a painting that was made with a camera lucida back in the day because uh -huh. the dimensions are so perfect that you can literally line them up. Wow. If they're of a piece of architecture, for instance, that's still standing to this day, you can yeah. find the exact spot that that painter must have been standing because of the dimensions oh, of cool. their painting. Um, but Vermeer, so mo a lot of Renaissance painters, because remember, a lot of a lot of Renaissance painters, we like to think of them as these like, oh, they were just you know creating art because art, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. that's what they did. Like, yeah, that's what they did, but they they that was their job. It was their career. They were mm -hmm. commissioned most times by a church or by a, a wealthy benefactor to paint something, be it a portrait or, uh, you know, or even something that that particular benefactor had in their mind. Mo most paintings that are in, uh, or lots of paintings rather that are in, you know, museums, lots of famous ones were commissions that were made for clients. And so, um, Vermeer was one of those, painters and one of the things that was most interesting uh that they discovered was during x-rays and such like that i guess an analysis of vermeer's work a lot of his paintings he never sketched outlines first he just put paint on canvas which is difficult to do um if if you know even as a trained uh artist if you're making a painting if you're an impressionist mm -hmm. fine whatever you're just putting paint on it's fine it's an impression it's the impression of the scene mm -hmm. right but vermeer very famously made paintings that were essentially as close to a photograph as one could get with an acrylic painting hmm. um but he did so without sketching anything first so the idea when did he live when what time frame are we talking I about i want to say he was the 1600s okay um renaissance period yeah so like 16 yeah 1600s i'm fairly certain was was vermeer um he definitely wasn't the 1700s how, how do you spell it uh v-e-m-e-e-r vermeer v what is it v-e-m-e-e-r vermeer painting okay mm -hmm. so it's interesting because it sounds like uh, yeah, 1632. Yeah, looks like was when he was born. And he he did do uh, he painted for those who are curious. He painted the girl with the pearl earring, which is a very famous okay. painting. Okay. Okay. Um, anyway, so so because he didn't paint with uh, initial outlines, there's been a lot of speculation about how he did that. Some people suggested that he uh, used a camera lucida. Mm -hmm. Some people suggested that he used a camera obscura which is also really cool. Um, I don't know if you've ever uh, done this or if you've seen this, this phenomenon, but a, cam a camera obscura is so cool. It's a pinhole, right? It's a pinhole. In a, in a, usually in a room. Yeah, exactly. And then it projects the image of whatever is out directly outside mm -hmm. of that pinhole onto whatever wall you're using. Yeah. You can literally create a giant camera obscura with a room, which is really cool. Like you can you know, just take any any room of your house that has enough light coming yeah. at it. Um, exactly. Yeah. Camera obscura. Um, so some people suggested that he must have used a camera obscura, that he created his own little booth. Yeah. Like with a, with a camera obscura. Cause a lot of his paintings were in the same place. They were obviously in his studio. Um, and so some people suggested that he may have made this little kind of confession booth yeah, size. Because it requires essentially yeah. not only a room, but controlling the light. Exactly. Yeah. In other words, the image is projected, but only into a dark room. Mm -hmm. yeah. And obviously you would have to have sufficient light on the opposite side. So only certain times of the day yes. you could do it. Unless you can move it, I suppose, if so it's somehow mobile. That's where the, the documentary got interesting, where you know they, they were thinking, oh, well, let's create this booth. Let's create... He, uh, the guy, Tim, actually got a studio, tried to set up lights mm -hmm. that were in the same position as most of the paintings that Vermeer did. Um, he made it the same size, and then he tried to create this little confession-style booth. And what mm -hmm. he discovered was that that the camera obscura works, but it's blurry. All camera obscuras are going to be blurry. No way to focus there's it. No way to focus a camera obscura. It's just what you see is what you get. So you, you can't. You think do, there's no? I mean, there must be a way, but at the time you're at saying, the time, yeah, right? So yeah. lens technology, and they didn't have a full concept of that. They and, did actually have lenses, which is why. But the other thing too, um, the other issue wasn't just focus. It was also um, it was also color. And as you just mentioned, light. If he was trying to paint in a dark room, mm -hmm. mixing color, matching color, 
impossible to do. Mm. It's like trying to trying to like read by the light of your phone without it being on, just like on the on the lock screen, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. that's it's it's gonna strain not your enough. eyes. You're not gonna be able to do it. But so they were like, okay, well, he couldn't have done this. He couldn't have mixed color. And the reason why that's important mm -hmm. is because if you look at Vermeer's paintings, his color is exact. Hmm. In fact, it's so good. The coloration is so good that from, uh, if you, from like one end of a wall to another end of a wall, which would otherwise be imperceptible change to the human eye, there is a discernible change of tone. That means like, oh yeah. So it's, it's not something that he could have done in a dark room. In he, a low light he situation. couldn't have right. realized that there was a shift in tone if he was looking at a dark image on a, on a dark wall. So interesting detective work. Yeah. Like you don't really think about art in this way Yeah, because yeah. it almost sounds like some people are critical of this, this type of device. Yes. So that, that brings us to the next thing, which is that it's um, what they, you know, this guy, Tim, came up with was Tim. yes what he came up with was the idea that it's very likely that Vermeer may have used uh, a, a mirror mm. um, but he also must have used a uh, a, uh, a lens a concave lens that he must have placed right in front of the mirror so think about it this way right so the 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 limitation of this device mm -hmm. is the fact that like I said it needs to be equidistant from the plane that you're painting on uh, to get the uniformity to get the uniformity if, if if this was even a little bit further back mm -hmm. the entire thing would be distorted and it wouldn't be possible interesting right? so what tim came up with was the idea that but if you put a lens tim like him he's your neighbor <laughs> I know, right yeah tim yeah, well, that was, yeah, tim's a good guy that's kind of the point because tim this this uh the subject of the documentary had very little to basically zero level painting experience and yet he was able to successfully reproduce with you know less slightly less talent he was able to reproduce a vermeer painting ah. with this oh this device. this modern day the guy that you were talking about Tim. yeah gotcha yeah Tim. um anyway so the idea that he came up with is that they, he must have put a lens equidistant from his painting um and that lens would have been a, a, like a convex or a concave lens so that it, it mirrored the image into the mirror Hmm. Um, that's the idea that he came up with. I think it was. I think it's a really cool idea. And hmm. then he must have moved the device around in order to get more aspects of the painting because the painting was larger than his thing. It, I mean, it's, this is a it's fascinating. It's wild. Yeah. And the fascinating thing is, is double. One that he could he could create and synthesize images at that time with mm -hmm. such degree of realism, mm -hmm. but then that he would be criticized for it. As if somehow what he did didn't require ingenuity and talent. I actually need to correct. Sorry. Um, there's no record that Vermeer was criticized for using this device, if he in oh, fact did oh, use oh, the device. I see. Okay. Um, I'm just saying, like, in the modern art world, mm -hmm. a device like this mm -hmm. um, is... I don't know. Some you know, people on the internet are going to say, like, this is, this is cheating. And I, I don't disagree with them. I, if you asked me, can you sketch mm -hmm. Mont Saint-Michel like just by looking at it no mm. i absolutely could not mm. and yet i'm able to do that with this device so mm -hmm. there is clearly an element of we'll call it a shortcut um but what this device is helping me to do is to understand the dynamics of shadow of how to mm -hmm. how to hold my pencil mm -hmm. right how to like figure out okay well if the light is coming from this direction there's going to be a hard shadow on this side and just mm. analyzing it while at the same time um, being able to create something that is actually pretty mm -hmm. instead of just being like, oh, all right, I spent an hour on this and it looks like a potato. Like, cool. How, how yeah. inspiring is right. that going to be? Right? So if it, you're just trying to start out at art, like, I'm, I, I hate that. I want to come up with something. I want, at the end of my, even if it's an amateurish attempt, at the end of my attempt, mm. I want it to be something I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of cool. I like doing it. It's kind of like why the piano teacher, the guitar teacher teaches you the, that first set of chords yes. that you can use to yeah. play a song yeah. that actually is familiar. Because exactly. then you're like, yeah. oh, I can play this. Yes. I can do this. It's proof. It's encouragement. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it shows because how many of these have you done now? So far, I've done, uh, I think, five different ones. Uh, did yeah. we go? I thought I saw more than that. There was a... Well, the first one that I ever did was this um, this bust of a nobleman. Uh, most of my most of my subjects are from the um, Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna because I'm very bougie. But uh, yeah, so there was a bust of a nobleman, <laughs> then there was a mask of Jupiter, uh, then there was an acrylic uh, painting, 
and then there was uh, Lake Bled, and then there was this. So not, yeah, I think not a fun. great name. Like for, blood, yeah, yeah not I, a great name. I've been there. I asked about. I asked a Slovenian, like, if it means blood, and they're like, no, no, it doesn't mean that. And I'm like, so what does blood mean? They're like, it's actually, it's just a proper name. So wow, yeah, I, <laughs> I know. And the it's, lake, it's trolling like sixteen hundred style. I know uh, the lake itself actually has um, perfectly turquoise water. Really? It's gorgeous, and they have very. Li- the reason why is because they have severely restricted any. There's no motorized hmm. boats that are allowed on the lake at Interesting. all. Interesting. It's a mountain top lake. It's no motorized boats. You can only get to the island. Well, it's not this island. You can only get to the island um, by uh, rowboat. Hmm. So. So here's an interesting kind of corollary then to the to the present day, right? So this is technology and art, mm-hmm. and it and it clearly even today has a measure of of um, controversy associated with it yes. because some people, as you said, would call this cheating. Mm-hmm. Despite the fact that you had to construct the device and you had to make sure that the measurements were perfectly accurate and then mm-hmm. you had to figure out how to properly trace it, and you're actually not tracing, you're actually drawing. We've mm-hmm. established that. Uh, and so then it kind of it kind of makes me think about things like, for instance, with the writer strike, right? Right yeah. now in, in in Hollywood, one of the concerns is what is a new form of technology, artificial intelligence, yeah. taking a role in producing original content, which mm-hmm. previously was the sole domain of only those talented enough to be able to actually act. Yes. What do you think about that? I think that it's. Like, when it comes to this, right, and like I was mentioning earlier, you know, a lot of the Renaissance painters were working on commission. So if Vermeer did use a device like this to speed up his process, that meant that he was able to make more money more quickly, right? And you can't he blame him there. Yeah, I, I, and at the time, of course, like, it would essentially be, yeah, even if it was, it, it would be a form of new technology yeah. that he either came up with or utilized um, and I feel as though like to criticize a, a, a person for, it would be like, you, it'd be like, uh, criticizing a, a plumber for using, or a, an electrician or whatever, a contractor for using a electric drill when they should be using just a, like a hand crank. They really drill. cared about they their really craft. They really cared about the craft. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting. I mean, not to get into the legal side too much, yep. but you know, you think about AI, right? And you think about, I mean, even in your line of work, right? You're, you're in video production. Mm-hmm. Um, so this question of, well, who worked for it? You know, if, yes. if you have, uh, let's pick a, pick an actor from a bygone age, maybe some deceased actor. Um, Humphrey yeah. Bogart. Sure. Humphrey yeah. Bogart. All right. So the Maltese Falcon, mm-hmm. right. Or, or Casablanca. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea that a computer could synthesize Humphrey Bogart hmm. seems odious on its face. Yeah. But why? Like, if we could have another Humphrey Bogart movie, yeah, wouldn't that be cool? But then also, it feels wrong. It does, and I'll. I, I think that the the reason it feels wrong goes to the heart. Of, this is this is a great question. I love this question because I. Um, the, the reason it feels wrong is because it goes to the very essence of why we as humans consider art to be art, mm. right? Um, if there is a painting that we see that looks appealing visually or whatever, it, it's, it's great. It's wonderful. Um, and we inherently, before AI started to exist, we would, we would see a painting and we would just know that a human being made this and they made it for a reason Mm -hmm. you know if it's an impressionist painting if it's a hyper realistic painting even Mm -hmm. if it's a photo that photographer took that paint took that photo Mm -hmm. in that place at that time because they were inspired to do so and there is inherently an aspect of that inspiration that is transferred from the artist to the viewer of that art subconsciously interesting way of putting it like like you look at any piece of art like the scream or whatever could easily have been generated by an ai especially nowadays as technology gets better but like that's not the point the Mm -hmm. point is not could it have been generated by a robot it is the fact that the artist decided to make that art in that way that conveys such emotion to us if we were to look at a painting like the scream almost identical to the scream that's made by an AI, I 
I mean, I personally would have no emotional connection to that painting. I'm hmm. like, okay, cool. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's like eye candy, but it's not, yeah. Well, but that you raised some interesting points because I think you've kind of ostensibly said that it's all about the subjective desire of the consumer. Yeah. But also so. possibly the artists themselves previous to the, you know, previous to AI. Mm -hmm. So there was, and I don't know why I'm blanking on it right now, but there was the trend, right? I, I forgot the precise name of it. It's on the tip of my tongue where they would create, the artist would create an original piece of, of artwork and then utilize blockchain to create mm -hmm. essentially a serial code of sorts. Mm -hmm. And then they would sell these specific images nfts and that's it nfts yeah. right yeah, yeah. and it seemed like what was that that was all the rage about what 24 months ago 36 months ago something like yeah, that yeah and then and, and then, oh man and somewhere. now we're seeing that there's been sort of a, a pendulum swing to the other side and it seemed I, I don't know what the current valuation of of these things were but i'm sure that you're going to get um lots of crypto enthusiasts who are very excited to extol just just how valuable their nfts are um, I've consistently thought of NFTs as, I, I don't know. I think that they're this, this weird little kind of, uh, they're at their, at the face of it, they're a scam, right? There may be some useful. Going to get hate mail now. I know, I know, We're right? getting hit. Okay. Yeah. In your opinion. <laughs> yes. Of course. Yes. yes. In my, in my opinion, which yes. of course will, will deflect all the hate mail. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's just his opinion. Right. 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 Um, right. but no, allegedly. So, to so, quote, to quote, Sir Russell Brand, allegedly. <laughs> so, I have, and I'll admit that I've I've looked into this a very small amount. I'm sure that there's lots of well, of crypto enthusiasts who will tell me that I'm wrong. But here's the thing: it's at light. the face of it, and at the end of the day, it's photons. No matter how much you use blockchain, which is a mathematical algorithm, right? A yeah. method of of reducing something to a ledger. It's a list. It's an mm -hmm. electronic ledger. Yes. But at the end of the day, it would be the same as trying to put some kind of patent on sunlight because that's the issue, isn't it? Like well, you could literally duplicate an NFT mm -hmm. and to the average, the person looking at it, there yes. would be no practical way to discern the difference, assuming yep. resolution is the same and assuming the screen is the same and so forth. The only way to d discern the difference mm -hmm. would be if you could, I guess, utilize that blockchain technology to verify that the version of the of the computer file you're looking at yes. is the one that was serialized and registered. Well, that's that's the thing, right? So the thing about NFTs um, that I think a lot of people in the the kind of crypto ignorant realm don't really understand is that NFTs are not a storage of data. They don't store the image on the blockchain. What they, does it stand for? Does it, a do non-fungible token. Okay. All right. um, and what a non-fungible token is, as far as my understanding, is it is essentially just a, a digital record, like you said, it's a ledger, it's a digital record of ownership, mm -hmm. right? If I take a photo, and I've actually had some 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 spam bots like spam my small Instagram. Yeah, I saw and be that. Like, oh, I would like to create NFT of your. Th I'm like, oh, great! I've In made it. In Kazakhstan, yeah. this is very useful. <laughs> but um, so so an we're, NFT is essentially we're going to get hate mail from Kazakhstan. I'm sure yep. it's a wonderful country. I'm sorry, Kazakhstan. Yeah, it's just I, yeah. my favorite. Yeah, sort of accent. But uh, I'm sure, it was exactly accurate. I'm absolutely guaranteed. Right. Yeah, there's nobody here who can who can d confirm or deny that. So yeah. we're going to go with 100% yes. confirmation. Yes. Anyway, so um, an NFT, from what I can understand, is essentially just a contract that says, hey, look, I own this piece of... It's a receipt. Yes, it's literally a receipt. And it points... With a picture on it. it no, it, the, NF the NFT itself is not stored on the blockchain. A link to the NFT is stored on the blockchain. Huh. But the NFT itself is not stored on the blockchain, as far as I can tell. So there that, might be some very small resolution images that okay. are stored. But like other than that, it's the blockchain can't contain, it can't hold that amount of data. So this is what we should look for. I mean, the comments is where people can tell us all the reasons why we're wrong. Absolutely. And the internet yes. is the best place to find out why you're wrong. Yeah. But if you're, if I take a photo right. of a piece of art, right, right. And my art, let's say I take a photo of a piece of my right. art, I put it online, right. and I, I mint an NFT with, mm -hmm. of it, right? Mm -hmm. What I'm doing is, as far as our understanding is, what I'm doing is I'm creating a little piece of digital paper that says, I own this photo of this art. How would that be different than a copyright registration, practically Literally, speaking? That's the question. And that's a question that's consistently come up and has had 
long rambling paragraphs from crypto bros saying like oh well it's actually this is like in the answer is actually that, how actually, do you spell that actually, yeah. actually like oh what you don't realize those like and no. no and the answer is that no there is no discernible answer some nfts apparently do have ascribed copyright in them where but that, like it's almost like a different legal yeah. structure it's almost like yeah. instead of the united states copyright you know patent and trademark office mm -hmm. Yes. You're just utilizing a different registration entity. Yes. yes. And one that is much more ambiguous. Because if I own NFT of Zombie Monkey 126. Which, by the way, I don't understand why that particular because imagery became but that's it when i think of nft i think yeah. of that that monkey it's, yeah it's it's because of it's because crypto bros and 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 tulips um but the, wait 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 the tulip thing yeah you're talking about the amsterdam I tulip am. yes i really want to follow up with that before we we sure. conclude but yeah. i do like the aggressive nft position you've taken I mostly because, because it's just it's 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 and fight and yeah. now the comments are going to tell us all the reasons yeah. why I've, why the NFT is the best thing in the world. My perspective on this is if you cannot tell me in a yes or no, if you have to direct me to your nine page, 3,500 word sub stack about why exactly <laughs> an NFT does provide certain things, but is better than copyright, but actually isn't. But then if you do this and if you trade it on the Ethereum network, I'm like, I don't, then, then it's not true. You're not telling me truth. You're just telling me a bunch of lies that you've likely told yourself about NFTs because you spent $500 or a thousand or $20,000 on zombie monkey one, two, six. I'm sorry. Like there's a certain point that you have to realize where it's like, you know, NFTs, if the if the information if the actual image is not stored on the blockchain, which many think that it is, but in fact is not, um, because remember, th keep, think about this, right? If if the if the concept of an NFT was as most people think it is, which is that the image itself is stored on the blockchain, that would make the entire blockchain network that is utilizing NFTs, which Ethereum, Bitcoin, whatever a cloud service that would be trillions of times like it would essentially be this it would have to be the size of the entirety of the internet it would have to have servers the size of the entirety of the internet to store all of the image data that people are trying to quote unquote upload to it and of course it would make it super slow so what i'm saying is that if all you're doing is providing me with a digital receipt that says i own this photo of this image Okay. No, I get okay, it. Okay, why? Shots have been fired. Yeah. All NFT uh, producers should probably feel personally yes. attacked by the travesty of, yeah. of this entire system if you that, as you described me, it. If you disagree with me, comment NFT exclamation <laughs> point in the comments. Uh, yeah, so allegedly, as to everything. Yeah, Again, allegedly, to yes. quote... To quote Sir Sir Russell Brand, yeah, and I I actually don't think he's been knighted, but yeah, I have not. I'd vote for him. I've not seen anyone um, come up and tell me like, oh no, I've never seen an article. I haven't seen anything that discernibly and definitively says that an NFT is anything other than just a digital receipt. Well, it it is interesting because it sounds like what you're talking about is how people perceive the value of something, and it mm -hmm. is both subjective and objective, right? Because mm -hmm. I, one of the things you touched on early on was sort of the kind of taking for granted that if you saw a piece of art hanging on the wall, good, bad to you, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter because you do know that there was some medium, paper, canvas, whatever it is, mm -hmm. a human being had to spend time yes. putting it together somehow, drawing it, creating it, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so there was a there was a physicality, which could be perceived as objective value, right? You could say, you know, this piece of paper, for instance, took a certain amount of energy to create, yeah. right? A certain amount of time went into it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, although there clearly was time put into the digital creation of the art, the problem is you, you are left without the physical feeling, the physical medium of it. Mm -hmm. And and then you also have the subjective, which is, of course, you know, what makes art good, right? Everybody's going to have a different opinion on that. 
And sometimes it's influenced by other people's opinion. You might not think it's valuable, but like, for instance, if someone came up to you and said, hey, here's, uh, here's an NFT, and wouldn't that be funny, right? Mm. You got an NFT, and then suddenly NFT is appreciated, you know, to the moon, yeah. right? Yeah. And then suddenly you're the holder of the most valuable NFT. Do you think your opinion on it would change? Um, okay, the way that I think about it is, is, is this. $20,000 buys you a pretty nice car, like a, an average newish car. Okay. Certainly used to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Justin Bieber bought. Oh, boy. All uh, right. Zombie Monkey 126 oh, okay. for $20,000, right. right? Jeez. Whatever. I don't know. Maybe he did. He, he definitely is famous for having bought one for like a million dollars. But regardless, let's say that it's 20000 Oh, he, for, you actually did. You're he did. saying this, he literally, oh, this yes, happened. He's famous for having bought an NFT. Um, many, as, as many do. But anyway, let's, let's just say for the sake of grounding it in reality, uh, our reality, um, that he bought it for twenty thousand dollars. He bought Zombie Monkey twenty, uh, you know, whatever. If Justin Bieber came to you or me or mm. you viewer at home, uh, and he said, "I would like to sell you Zombie Monkey one two three for twenty thousand dollars," you might be like, "Well, I have, I have, I have twenty thousand dollars of of cryptocurrency." I can give it. You'd be like, "Yeah, awesome." But what if he said, "No, I don't want your cryptocurrency. I want your car." Will you sell me this Im or will you sell me your car in exchange for this image of a zombie monkey one, two, three? Would you say yes to that? Would you say yes? I believe that this I mean, we have JPEG a question now in the comments. We do yeah. need to have answers. Yeah. So would let us say, know what you think, folks. You this say, is an interesting trade. And th that's the thing. And the reason I'm asking it is because like I'm trying to ground cryptocurrency and digital currency and NFTs and the the tulip thing into a reality that we can understand. Would you tr would you literally think not just that sure fine maybe you take that trade. Maybe you say yes. And this is assuming that I haven't pressed the button to release the hounds as yes. soon as I see yeah. Mr. Bieber yeah. setting foot yeah. on my property. So so let's say that you let's say that that you take that trade, mm -hmm. right? You yourself take that trade because among other things, sure, you know, actually Justin Bieber adds value because then it's a historic moment like, oh, I am the dude who bought But this the is thing just psychology. For, no, this know, is just people but, thinking it's got value. Sure, yeah. But let's let's follow through on this, right? Let's let's say that you buy the NFT from Justin Bieber because it's Justin Bieber or whatever and you buy it for $20,000 mm -hmm. and then do you genuinely think that you could resell that, not for twenty thousand dollars in cryptocurrency, but for another car. Do I mean, honestly, currently, it doesn't could... seem like it would be possible because there's no. not enough demand. Yeah. So, but, like, but the tulip example, which yeah. we've sort of danced around, is mm -hmm. a perfect testament to how that was precisely the thing that happened, right? So, for yeah. people that don't know, and I don't, I don't know this, you know, word for word, but the gist of it was that probably around the same time as Vermeer, right? It was yeah, it's a sixteen um, sixteen hundred. I think let's look it up. Was it the Amsterdam? Tulip crisis. Yeah. Tulip. Was it appreciation? Uh, I think actually, if you just look it up, like, crisis? like Tulip um, bubble or whatever, that it'll come. Tulip it's, mania is what first came up. So the, the Wikipedia page on it talks about during the Dutch golden age. Mm. And yeah, it was in, let's see, 1634. And it basically was a massive massive increase in the price of tulips but it was triggered because everyone suddenly thought tulips could only go up right mm -hmm. it was t the first that we know of to the moon and yeah. it was purely purely psychological there was no there was no specific let's say reduction in the supply of tulips that would cause the price to go up there was no immediate demand aside from the mania apparently mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or the or the mindset behind it and so that was an interesting in, uh, example of where, in effect, tulips became a currency, right? Yeah. You were walking around, and it was practically no different than NFTs. But the big difference was that tulips were real. They required a certain amount of energy. Yes. But we saw almost the same kind of boom and bust, assuming the NFTs have busted. Um, they haven't yet, but they will. I mean, they, they've busted since they go in cycles. But like a Allegedly. Lot of, yeah. Allegedly, a lot of people are. We need to have that recording. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if we can soundbite. Yeah, yeah. Request it from, um, from Mr. Brand. 
a lot of people will point to the fact that cryptocurrencies in general go through regular boom bust cycles, but at the end of their bust, they are always higher than the previous bust, which suggests and implies explicitly that there is an increasing value of cryptocurrency over time, regardless of the more immediate fluctuations. So a lot of people will point to that and they will say NFTs are going through the same period of boom and bust. They are more rec they're more recent invention than cryptocurrencies. And as such, we haven't seen their history yet. So yes, while they are on the lower end, because their value is usually tied to cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. we will expect them to go up in value. Zombie Monkey One Two Three will eventually get back to twenty thousand dollars. Don't you worry; you're going to get your money back. Gotcha. Um, We've seen that with Bitcoin. You know, people we, people in the early days would mm -hmm. would see those same. I mean, we still see fluctuations, don't we? Yes. Yeah. Um, and we do. I mean, obviously, things are on the rise again because, like, one there's there's the. What we've seen with cryptocurrency, in my opinion, is uh, that kind of form of mania. Um, uh, kind of happen and then crash and happen and mm -hmm. crash and it's been accelerated in its its frequency and its duration um, by just the, the existence of the internet. I think that that you know if if tulips existed today or whatever, like it would go probably in a similar direction. Um, I don't think that cryptocurrency is ever going to become uh, valued down to zero. I, I don't think that I think cryptocurrency is genuinely the, the the probably a structure of the future of how currency is going to formulate in today's digital world. Um, but I don't think that NFTs are the way that that copyright is going to be transferred. Mm -hmm. Or if it is, I, I just I don't think that NFTs are going to be the the end all be all of copyright. If I bought a photo but of Zombie Monkey One Two Three, do I own the rights to use that in branding? Do I own the rights to print that commercially, or do I just own the rights to put that as my profile picture on X? But now, I mean, to to sort of take the devil's advocate position though, and it just occurred to me, it is kind of attractive though when you think about ease of use. So for instance, mm. right now, yes, certain copyright protections ex exist upon creation, but we know yeah. that you don't get the full benefit unless you've gone through the more formal method of registration and so forth. And mm. so f in the 21st century, you know, relatively speaking, there are a lot of steps there as yeah. opposed to, for instance, the idea that you could, you know, snap the photo mm -hmm. with your phone and then assuming that there was some kind of electronic mechanism, essentially copyright it, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. right? Utilize NFT style registration. Mm -hmm. And then now you actually have the benefit of the full copyright protection. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in that sense, I never thought of it in those terms before. That could be interesting. The I agree with you that having like a more secure, less hackable form of... of um, digital representation of one's ownership than simply posting on social media might be a better idea. No, no. But, like, but, well, like, but like, what what is the, functionally, the only difference between me posting a photo of this on social media, thus indicating with a time-stamped date that I have created this piece of art at this time, on this date, the only difference between that social media post and uh, an NFT registration of the same ownership would be that the NFT can't be hacked, it can't be tampered with, whereas my Instagram theoretically could get hacked and the images could get deleted and therefore the record could get deleted. Yeah, it's less so from that standpoint, more so from the protection of the artist's legal interests kind of standpoint. So mm -hmm. for instance, right now there's probably, I would, I would actually guess most, most artists have not taken the extra step to register their yeah. artwork, right? Yeah. You know, you publish a video, for instance, of a particular event or a wedding or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. and have you registered it? No, no, no. Most people wouldn't have. But what if by taking that photo, image, whatever, you just click, boop, register on, a, on an app on a phone, mm. assuming that's as easy, a, a, that's how it is to create an, a, an NFT. Yeah. I could see there being value in having the extra legal protection that that would bring. Because then, you know, like Getty's images, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. They register their content, right? They have a mechanism for doing that. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of content creators out there that will, will register. But what if, what if sort of the, 
we'll call them the the everyday, you know, sort of on the street type artists were able to enjoy a level of protection uh, legally that would be far and away greater than what they currently own. So it's not so much hacking. It's not so much the concern about, oh, they got into my, let's say, my social media page. It's more the, hey, I actually have the added legal protection of being able to say, look, I registered this. With a click of a button, I was able to utilize blockchain technology to create a legal registration, which I can then use to enforce my legal interests if that image were to be unlawfully used elsewhere. Yeah. And I wouldn't have to go through the rather rigorous steps currently in place. I'm not advocating for more government, but if the U.S. Copyright Office mm. uh, were to implement something similar to this, it seems hard for that to be a bad thing. I mean, I don't think you're wrong. And uh, like well, we got said, that on camera. Yeah. We get that on camera. Could you? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I agree. I, I think that that you know, I think that it's it's very it's a very well known fact that government takes a while to catch up to technology. Um, and I think that in a way, pivoting a little bit, um, I think in a way, technology has already, like this this type of thing, NFTs and even AI to a certain extent, because uh, there are m musical AIs and such, um, I think that th all of these are essentially a, a, a response to the, at this point, very antiquated, and one might also argue monopolized um, area of copyright mm -hmm. issues. Right. Somebody goes and they say, like, I want to use this Smash Mouth song, mm. R.I.P., the lead singer of Smash Mouth. Um, but somebody goes and says, I want to use the, 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 the Smash Mouth song oh. in, uh, you know, in my in my Call of Duty uh, montage that I'm uploading. And then it like gets Twitch copyright streamer or something. Yeah. Yeah. And then it gets copyright struck because can't use it. OK, fine. But like, Yes like legally that absolutely makes sense the owner of that song right the creator and and therefore the person who has the rights to it has also the right to decide how they want that song to be used that does make sense legally and even one might say morally justified um but so much of what art is 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 derivative it's it's based off of previous iterations of similar things like that even even the renaissance painters were basing you know what they saw off of you know the trends that were all like you know music today is based off of inspiration from all music so you know it's it's always echoes and echoes and echoes and what we're seeing today is increasingly restrictive copyright um issues at least in america that I would argue are stifling that spirit of of creating art from art, right? And you're seeing the response of that essentially be AI, hmm. right? The AI art, AI generated art. Of course, like it's also quite lazy in some cases, but like the the heart of it is this idea that a person's like, well, I don't. I don't want to like run afoul of the copyright office. I don't mm -hmm. want to run afoul of, of the law, mm -hmm. but I still want to use like a, a cool piece of art for my whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Or I, I still want to, you know, try dabbling in this, or I, I want to like, you know, I don't want to have to pay thousands of dollars to the original artist of this, you know, super famous artwork to yeah. create my, my YouTube logo. Right? right, but I still want that, and what what you're seeing is somebody being like, okay, well, AI mm -hmm. exists, and you, know, you can just say like in the style of, mm -hmm. and then get an image that is close to what you want, and then use that image as of right now, without any legal complications at all, without any copyright strikes. Sure. Right? Yeah, I mean, to be fair though, I, these things perhaps are distinct, though closely related. I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds like you're talking about the the chilling effect, basically, that the legal framework has on ingenuity and, and artistic expression and, you know, coming up with new things yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And, and, and then also, of course, there's this other question of, um, you know, is AI, well, is AI really art of, you know, is it true intelligence? Because if it is, isn't it like slavery? <laughs> wow. Um, but if it isn't, and, I, and it seems like at this stage, we're not at the point where, you know, it has sentience, it seems like it could be 
Oh, I see. On the cusp okay. of being sentient. Hmm. Right now, it seems like a highly advanced computerized program, which is ostensibly no different than, you know, a mouse click, you know, or, or yeah. a button press or using a stylus perhaps on a touchscreen or something like that. But right now, it does not seem like AI is bad when it comes to content creation. But there's clearly controversy, right? So oh, yeah. Hollywood, the Hollywood strike, one of the things that seems like they've complained chiefly about is they've mm-hmm. said, listen, studios are basically scanning us, learning us, and mm-hmm. simulating us. Yeah. And then this is an interesting question, right? You talked about, well, I want to do something in the in you know in the style of, for instance. So if you had, you know, Michael Jackson, right? We've we've heard about this. This is yeah. the using the Michael Jackson hologram, mm-hmm. and it sounds like that was utilizing an early form of AI. Seems like it, yeah. But the question sort of becomes, okay, well, we do have laws that deal with use of someone's image for for individual profit, right? So mm-hmm. you'd have to this this misappropriation of someone's. Uh, likeness mm-hmm. is usually actionable in some form at the federal or at the state level somewhere. Mm-hmm. So we know that like you couldn't you couldn't scan me and then go around selling posters of Zach yeah. right for profit. Mm-hmm. Not that anyone would buy those. <laughs> but if you were to recreate me in a scene like for a let's say a documentary or something like that. Mm-hmm. Is that a problem in the moral sense? It kind of seems to be the argument Hollywood is making right now. Like the yes. actors seem to be saying, we don't agree with that. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a lot of multi-tiered um, elements to this. So number one, you are right that what nope. we are... Second time. Second time. Ah. We've got it documented. Ah. Um, you're right. <laughs> what we are calling AI is not true artificial intelligence. It is essentially machine learning, mm-hmm. um, which I don't... I'm not going to say that I know basically anything about that, but I do know that artificial intelligence, as we would consider it, like data on mm-hmm. Star Trek right. or you know any right. of those types of things, are are that that's essentially a sentient machine yeah. versus what we have, which is machine learning, which is essentially a very complicated algorithm that has access to a treasure trove of data that it can analyze and then spit out based off of prompts that are given to Faking it. Faking it, basically. Yes. Faking so it's, it's, interaction. Yeah. The the um, the Turing test mm-hmm. yep, is right. very famous for, you know, like, oh, if you can have a conversation with an AI uh, and it can be convincing that it's a human, yeah. then, then it's passed the Turing test. Cool. Awesome. Great. ChatGPT can do that. But nobody really thinks that ChatGPT is alive. Even ChatGPT doesn't state that it's alive. Yeah, it talks about how it's a language. uh, What is it? Analysis model or something. Yeah, it's because I've I've tried it out. I was very curious. I was like, like you said about data. I mean, there was an entire episode uh, of Star Trek where they they literally tried to answer the question. It was a trial. If if I if I recall. And it was an episode where they were basically dealing with these super heavy issues way ahead of their time where they were trying mm-hmm. to say, is data alive? Mm-hmm. And and it was interesting because in a show, science fiction, you know, where they basically considered almost anything to be alive, you would have thought this would have been an easy question. Yeah. But they raised good points. Uh, what about, uh, you've heard about these AI-generated social influencers? You've heard mm-hmm. about the totally synthesized... No. Um, yeah, so there's there are now accounts, I guess, popping up on the various platforms where it's pure AI. You know, of course, most of the time they tend to be very attractive people, but they are not real people. So I've heard of um, NPC social medias, but those are real people that are acting like yeah. NPCs. Yeah. Um, so it's, I, you know. There was, there was one thing that I wanted to say because it was a point that popped into my head that kind of relates to this, which I think is quite interesting. And it specifically relates to art. And, I'm, and to be clear, I'm not saying this is a good thing mm. or a bad thing. I'm saying it's probably what's going to happen. When, before the invention of the camera, um, so much of the professional art world, mm-hmm. uh, the illustrators world, essentially were, was geared around creating realistic illustrations. Mm. Meaning if you were a landscape artist and you were commissioned to go to a place and take a, and to draw an image of that yeah. place, your goal was to make sure that it was as close to real as possible. So you could come back presented to the to the people maybe they would make a print out of it or whatever but regardless and that way people could see it mm-hmm. i'd be like oh this is the you know this is the the um the temple in mm-hmm. rome the Colosseum, whatever like, yeah the person in england can see the Colosseum without 
going there. That was the goal. The cameras took her derbs. The camera then got invented, mm -hmm. right? And then what you saw almost immediately after the camera was invented and started getting widespread use because it became more portable was the rise of the Impressionists. Mm. Monet, mm. right? Et cetera. Like the mm. Impressionists made, they were not required to create a realistic image of anything. So they decided, all right, I will create the impression of the scene. What oh. does the scene feel like to a human? Yeah. Right? What do, what do I think of this scene? I'm going to put all of that into my paintings. Huh. When was the... I was just looking at when the camera was invented to try to figure out when the... Uh, what the time frame is. Because it kind of sounds like Vermeer would have been kind of on this cusp, right? Like he was using a t piece of technology to try to, to try to create this super hyper-realistic mm -hmm. uh, landscape, probably right before what we would consider today to be a practical camera. Yeah, I think uh, I, I want to say the, the camera was invented and then it was it was like 20 years or so before it would, could actually become like commercially usable. Who knows if this is accurate, but the first result says that 1816 is the date of the invention of the camera, I guess, as we think of it. Um, invented by a, a Frenchman. Lumière. I'm going to... I'm going to destroy this last name. Joseph uh, Nisifor. Oh, I don't know. Nep yeah. Nepsy? Nepsy? Don't know. I'm, well, anyway. sure, I'm sure my ignorance is going to uh, so you, quickly get addressed online. Yeah. Well, so you uh, had this, right? You had this effect. And, and then also a Parisian painter in 1829, last name Daguerre. Oh, the Daguerreotype. Yes. yes right. Exactly. Yes. And, um, and that would have been, I guess, the first, mm -hmm. because that had a practical exposure. So I guess yeah. the, the concept would have been early to mid-1800s. And then we had Edison, looks like. He got in on it. Getting in on the video side, of course. And that would have been, uh, looks like, 1890s, according to this mm -hmm. article. But interesting. But, so you had this you had this effect, yeah. right? It was, a, it was a widespread effect. Obviously, the Impressionists became huge. Yeah. I'm sure there were impressionists prior to the invention of the, of the photograph, but in general, they became very popular after the invention of the, of the camera. Um, and I genuinely think that that's what AI is going to do for art. Again, I don't know that that's, that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, but I, see I what do you're know saying. it's going, it's, it ha it's going to fundamentally shift the way. That's a that good, it's a good example though, because what you're talking about was there was a thing that was done by hand, yes. right? Manually, if you want to call it that. Yes. And then there was a machine that came around that did the thing that was done by hand mm -hmm. automatically and in a fraction of the time, relatively speaking. Yes. I mean, obviously exposures back then took longer than they do now, but still yeah. how many hours went into that landscape versus how many hours went into set up the camera, take the cam take the photo, develop the mm -hmm. photo, you were probably talking about a fraction of the time. Mm -hmm. And now with AI, it's another machine, mm -hmm. digital this time, but a machine yeah. that, that takes the work that used to be done, let's say, by an actor or a singer mm -hmm. or an artist. Yeah. And what would have taken, uh, you know, baseline of time, we'll call it X, right? Yeah. It's, now, it's now X minus a considerable amount of, you know, as a percentage, right? Yeah. So the, the end result is fraction of the time. I mean, I've seen it in photo editing, for instance. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in video, in videography, I imagine like things like touch up work and stuff like that. It seems mm -hmm. like it is reducing workloads massively in ways yeah. that could not have been thought of before. Clearly there's a positive there. Yeah. It's interesting as this debate rages, as much as I enjoy taking a side, mm -hmm. I've kind of felt neutral because yeah. there are definitely good things. Like we hear about Call of Duty, right? The, the video game Call of Duty. I think mm -hmm. Activision, I'm not positive. I think Activision is the, is the uh, developer behind that. They've been talking about how they want to reduce what has been termed hate speech uh, in, their, uh, in their online chats, right? So when mm -hmm. people are playing video games, we've all played video games. We've all heard atrocious things. Yeah. And, you know, their thought was we need to limit this. Now, I'll, I'll say I don't know that I view that as being something that... Um, that on its face sounds like a great idea. I mean, yes, they're a private company, but the idea of kind of knowing what you're getting into there, it seems like if you're going to play a video game like that, you should probably just accept it. It comes with yeah. this or just I mean, turn it's rated, off it's rated the M for mature. Right. Yeah. If there's a, if, if, there was a, if there was a way, like a, if they turned that into a parental filter, 
right? If they were like, you can turn on and off, like a parent voluntary. can turn on off, yeah, right? Voluntary, yeah, voluntary. Right, like yeah. then, sure. Like, do the AI for yeah. when your eleven year old is playing Call of Duty, which yeah. right. maybe the eleven year old shouldn't be. Playing maybe they shouldn't be playing, but if they right. want to, let's say they play Fortnite, right? Okay, so like you know, there's still yeah. probably tons of of profanity and and right. untoward things happening on that chat. So if a parent had the opportunity to turn on the AI yeah, right. filter, right? Cool, awesome, one hundred percent. That sounds great. Yeah. But I agree that it's it's the overarching like, oh no, we're just doing this universe. It has an Orwellian vibe. It I mean, does. You're yeah. not going to hear me challenge the legality of it. I'm not even going to challenge necessarily, strictly speaking, the morality of it. I think we all agree, yeah. immaturity and vitriol and all that kind of stuff is not great. Yeah. Uh, but with regard to the idea that this could be a test run for something, uh, you know, on a greater scale, that mm. that might be something where you could start to see ill. You could start to see negatives in AI. But then at the same time, as it helps things like efficiency, precision, mm -hmm. uh, the the literal creation of new genuine you know content. I mean, look at how you've oh. shifted. You know, we talked about Hollywood. Everybody is talking about how the how the media production sphere is evolving. Right? Yeah. We're doing this right now, which we could not have done mm -hmm. even twenty years ago. Yeah. This this show right now would not have been feasible because yes. of the technology required. Um, so it's interesting to see how how this technology is is kind of advancing. This I've, is oddly enough such a perfect way hmm. to have started this conversation because this was considered this uh, this device was considered scandalous at one point. I'm sure. Seems. Yeah. And now we're talking about machines and art yeah. in the same terms. That's very true. I've had an awesome time. Yeah. I love this conversation. I do too. Um, it's fun. I'd love to have you back on. Yeah. See how this has progressed for you. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm here for it. Thanks yeah. so much for coming on. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's been very, very fun. This was fun. Yeah. We'll talk again soon. Yep. Bye.